Hi everyone, Tom here with some more content from the 3D Print Show Berlin. And guess who was there too? Richard Horn, aka Richrap, who's probably one of the most important people in the core rap rap movement. If you don't know who he is, go check out his blog at richrap.blogspot.com. This week, he was here as a writer for the Disruptive Magazine, the official publication of the 3D Print Show worldwide. So I grabbed him to do sort of a recap of the Berlin show with me. We didn't really prepare anything, but it turns out Rich is the one who's actually pretty good doing that sort of stuff. No fuzz, here we go. So what's been the most exciting thing for you you've, you've seen here today? I should have thought about these. <laughs> um, hang on. Uh, so yeah, I guess um, some of the interesting things today, we've got quite a few new printers. So there are some, uh, there's a, a printer in the style of a, or a 60s retro fridge, yeah. which is really interesting. Well worth a couple of pictures and uh, have a chat to those guys later. Uh, and I think that's, for me, that's quite interesting because there's, 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 they're trying to do something a bit different. They're trying to take something that uh, already exists, the 3D printers that are out here today, and a lot of them are the same, and people have been commenting on which which 3D printer should I buy, because they all look very similar, they do the same things, and a lot of the manufacturers are telling them things that they want to hear, like it goes really fast, or it can produce, it can print in lots of materials, but a lot of them still look very similar, look the same, and um, still quite ugly. So that one that looks like a fridge was quite an interesting point, just to see that, you know, there are other designs coming through. Um, we've seen some faster printers, the Wasp printer is pretty fast, that, that prints pretty fast, it's got a nice setup with the extruder, and uh, and they're doing a good job, but it's, um, it freaks people out a little bit sometimes, seeing the extruder wobbling around like that so uh, I think again what people want to do with the machines and uh, and how, how you know how they how they're going to fit in with their environment whether they're at home or in the office uh, is, is playing more of an impact on what people's choices and buying decisions of course the Ultimaker still looks good it looks a nice looking printer um, it's a, yeah, a nice looking printer and um, yeah, it's still a nice choice, but pe people are asking now, what, what printer should they buy rather than, uh, you know, what, what can they do? That's, that's been one of the main things for the show. What I li really like seeing is that uh, the companies are showing a lot more about uh, what the applications are, what you can do with it. Uh, for example, the food printing. I mean, it's, it's been a subject for so long and we're finally seeing it being used somewhere. Um, I mean, they're, they're making uh, one-off decorations, they're printing fonts, they're printing molds um, for actually reproducing uh, specific, specific uh, jelly food, oh, what is it? Uh, Gelatine and, type, yeah. yeah. So there's a, I, I think, yeah, the, the, the food printing, we always get a lot of questions about food printing, so it's been really nice uh, to see some actual applications, and they're still quite... Um, in the future, there's still there's still a lot of imagination there, and there's still one area you can dream and think about because there's a lot of processes involved in through food printing and the preparation and everything else. They've got a difficult time doing it at a show, uh, but actually the results are quite nice. The people are commenting that they, that's the sort of thing they want to see, want to do, and um, I think it still creates quite a buzz, quite a bit of imagination with people about that sort of thing. And the other materials they've got on the stand as well, there, there's some really nice silicon materials and uh, precious metal clay and other things so some really good stuff yeah. so as far as materials go uh, there's verbatim here uh, with a with their own booth and they've introduced a new flexible filament um, how much do you see that becoming a, a relevant thing I mean there are enough companies out there that are doing uh, metal filled filaments that are doing flexible filaments uh, you know premium low-end filaments do we do we need another filament vendor I, I th yeah I think the material side uh, is is getting very busy there's a lot of people doing me too copies same sort of things the one thing that was really um, clear last night after the show a lot of people were discussing materials that was what was going on sort of in in the, the, the sort of after show party and that was quite interesting because people were saying about mixing materials and getting different hardnesses so at the moment you've got ninja flex and you've got filler flex and you've got flexible materials but they're at a set hardness, they're at a set flexibility and people are saying they really want to vary that, they want to be able to change that but they don't want to have lots of different types of filler flex, lots of different types of ninja flex they actually want to try and do that on the fly and as the print happens so I think that might be the next step that we're starting to see with materials that they'll become a bit more dynamic or we'll be able to mix them a bit better and produce 
harder and softer materials and the same with composites as well it's nice that there's carbon fiber composites and those other strong stronger materials but again you don't want to print your entire object with those just single materials most of the time so the dual mixing and um, uh, the more the more uh, sort of creative mixing elements and nozzles that we that we come up with to try and blend these materials or to change their hardness levels change them their material properties is is probably going to be a big thing for the next few years but I do agree there's a lot of materials and no we don't need any more PLA manufacturers yeah. we, we need more composites composites are great and again that's an area where um, we're finding there's a lot of confusion people are still sort of thinking that the uh, metal uh, 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 print uh, filaments uh, they, they can get they can get properties out of it that are like metal but they're still plastic they're still thermoplastic so just you know reassuring people that yeah they, they do feel quite nice and they give different different uh, textures and properties to the to the finished prints but they're still a thermoplastic but you can use them on desktop 3d printers which is the benefit so I guess at the moment we're in that transitional phase of still living with FDM based technologies and, and doing our best with the with the filaments that we that we can produce um, but really people do want to print in more than just plastic and that that's still going to take us a, a while I think to to get over that so. Uh, Dynamo 3D, they showed off a graphene filled polymer, which is a, I don't know, I asked them what was in it and they said uh, it's graphene, it's carbon, it's, it's PLA, ABS, not, what not, they, they, they wouldn't exactly tell me what it was, so yeah. Um, but what do you think about that? I mean, I think it's, it's conductive, it's made to be really conductive, but right now I just don't see the printers that would actually take advantage of a conductive filament. No, it, it, that's, that's a really good point. I've, I've experimented with l lots of different um, conductive filaments and um, uh, tested various different ways to make it more or less conductive. Even, I think, um, Adrian at RepRap Pro has been doing some work on silver, adding silver, actual silver particles into filaments, which is really interesting. It's very expensive, but it does actually produce some of the best um, uh, electrical, electrical properties in, in materials. I'm really dubious about uh, graphene and graphene oxides and things like that because that's not what they're supposed to be for. They're supposed to be a surface coating on materials, so they're not supposed to be mixed in because when you mix it in or you clump it together you produce graphite and you don't want to produce graphite you want to produce, keep it as graphene so I'm really dubious about that I, one, of the, one of the things I saw recently was a test that used um, granule, granule material and actually mixed graphene in and that coated all of the granules um, with a, a surface of, of graphene what then happened was the guy heated the material the, the, the materials and squashed it all together so what you get is a, a surface coating on all of those materials going through and actually that produced an incredibly uh, um, electrically uh, conductive block of plastic because it was all on the surface of those it wasn't mixed in it was all on the surface so that was fantastic but it just proved the point that graphene is supposed to be a surface coating to conduct through and not in through through plastic so I'm really dubious whether or not all of these graphene and and any types of mixed composites will actually work as, as, as a lot of people have even been saying they work. So until I've tested them, I can't say. But it's exciting, of course. It's new, it's different, it's new materials. But I think, yeah, we, we will have to wait and see whether or not it's actually useful in, in the market, yeah. So the other thing that's about the 3D printing market and, and machine market is a carbon 3D, and they promised a super fast SLA printer that uses a, a uh, oxygen filled enriched um, what is it called um, inter inter me membrane yeah an, an interface um, so that it could theoretically print faster I mean I really expected them to see them here on the show do you think speed is actually something that that still matters on 3d printing or, or is it just a, a nice to have feature <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, at the Madrid show there was a lot of people saying that they really wanted a 3D printer, but they wanted a fast 3D printer, so they were asking which are the fastest, what, what can it do, and of course the FDM based technologies are all very similar, and even the DLP resin based printers are, are similar again, so they're two different technologies and it's interesting that Carbon 3D have come out with this new method uh, of using the oxygen permeability through there to, to stop the sticking process, which really just speeds up naturally 
naturally the whole process of growing an object in a vat of resin. Um, I'm a little dubious about how well it will work because they've only showed objects that have got very fine detail and um, small surface areas. So I, I would really love to see them print a very solid cube of their entire print surface because I imagine they're not going to be able to print that very fast because they can't get the amount of material drawn underneath the cube to cure to go for the next layer so I, I think that's for me going to be a really interesting point is is it is it a technology that can only be d printed with certain things? You can only print certain things with it, or are they going to find a way of being able to draw the material under fast enough so they can actually pull pull large size materials out? So, and also it's been very interesting. Just the last few days, people have turned the entire um, print process on the, on the head and uh, printed in similar speeds to carbon 3D from a top down process. So lowering the the object into a vat of resin and printing from the surface, and people are getting almost the same speed printing as carbon 3D. So within a matter of days, you know, the open source community has managed to produce, replicate the results without infringing their patents and without doing all of the things that carbon 3D have done very technically. And I think that's a, uh, an interesting point because carbon 3D have said they may get the printer out this year towards the end of the year. It, you know, they may be, and I'm sure they're going to be a big company, I'm sure they're going to do very well and it's going to be a reasonable high price point for that machine, but will other companies now take that principle of growing the object quite quickly and working on the resins, working on the processes and maybe uh, working around their patents because they've published all, all of their results, they've published all of their work, so getting around their particular patented method could be something that uh, you know is, is obviously going to be a challenge for the community to do now. The, the gauntlet has been laid down, speed is important and there's new processes and new resins coming out to do that so I'm quite excited to see what, what the community comes out with and uh, it's an area I've been working on for a few months now as well with resin printing so uh, it's yes it's an interesting time for the, for the industry but certainly Certainly people want faster printers. Definitely. And I mean, especially once you scale it up to an industrial scale, where, where it's a choice between buying five slow printers or one fast printer, then it really matters. But um, for the consumer, um, I don't think it, it matters all that much. And when you, you know, for the end consumer, low end market, um, you, you're not permanently using your 3D printer. Um, I don't know, even I, I'm, I'm probably a power user, I guess, uh, and uh, I print something every two days or so, and I, I get, still get over 90% downtime on my printer. I, I, I don't use it that much. But I mean, the, the other thing you're seeing is uh, better mechanical designs, which means either faster speeds or a better print quality at lower speeds. So it's, it's always kind of a trade-off. Yeah, ju just uh, on, the, on the speed side, I think for me, got quite a busy life so I like to print in the evenings when I come home from work and and, and actually I've, I've got about four or five hours that I can set a print off and I like it to finish before I go to bed so and I've talked to other people that do exactly the same thing so it depends if you want to leave your printer running through the night or you want to do it only at weekends because I find some of the larger prints I save up until the weekend and sometimes I don't do them because I run out of time so I think the important period is really sort of to do things in a few hours or you know four, four or five hours at the max if you start pushing it to 12 15 24 hour prints people are not that prepared to do that uh, the average you know uh, person to do that and even in a working day if you're doing it in an office you want to print it in six hours or so so you don't want to leave these things running particularly overnight so I think I think the speed is still important and it's so it's an area where as 3d printing has improved we've got speed of benefits but then we've knocked the speed back down because we've got we wanted better quality quality resolution and better better quality print so we've always been chasing that better quality higher speed and um, certainly that it brings a whole load of problems when you print fast and that that that, that is going to be a, an area of constant change and constant evolution so we'll see some interesting developments but might be why the resin printing be, will be more appropriate to go faster because that might just be an easier way to pump more energy into resins, get them cure faster and produce prototypes of higher quality rather than trying to force the FDM printers to do things that they really are not that happy with doing. <laughs> And of course, with uh, resin printers, you don't have that many moving parts that could start oscillating resin or whatever. So one, one more thing that we've been seeing uh, quite a bit of uh, here at the 3D Print Show is scanning applications. And um, for example, there's the My 3D Twin scan booth, which has a, a camera array. I suppose I haven't been in there actually, um, but it has a, a 360-degree camera array 
um, that scans your entire body in a single shot. Um, then there's the Fuel 3D scanner that takes a single picture from one perspective, um, which can be used for, for medical applications or, for example, for uh, augmenting a computer-generated CGI figure, placing your face onto a computer game figure, for, for example. Um, where do you think that's heading? I mean, it's... Yeah. I think the, the scanning element is, is a really interesting one because it's a, a, a point that gets data into the computer, a starting point for people. So there's certain um, technologies that are really going to make a huge amount of difference to the tool chain for everyone in 3D printing. Scanning, certainly for me, is, is one of those key elements. Um, I've, I've still been waiting for my, th my Fuel 3D scanner. I ordered one a while ago. And uh, yeah, if you're out there, I really want it. Um, <laughs> but I hopefully get it soon because I'm really, really looking forward to using that. And it's a fantastic piece of equipment um, to do medical scanning and all that sort of thing. But the detail is great. I think the the My 3D Twin and the sort of figurine scanning that has been popping up is an interesting uh, um, area because uh, today I've had a couple of conversations with people saying that uh, they really like the idea of that and actually one lady was saying that she thought that her 93 year old grandmother would really appreciate a family portrait that was in 3D so she could feel and look and move and turn around more than a 2D picture so I think to me that was really quite an interesting application that yeah it's not just wedding cake wedding cake toppers and things like that, that actually there could be some elements that, that benefit that type of capturing. Um, there's been a lot of talk about how easy they are to use and how they stitch the pieces together and that's been an area that, that um, has been awkward for a lot of scanners to actually pull together lots of different meshes and make them work into a single object that you can actually print. So that's still a bit of a challenge. I know Fuel 3D has spent a lot of time, most of their development has been ploughing into a really good tool chain for their, for their scanner. So I'll be interested to see how well they're, how, how much more they push that. Um, and we'll just see. I think the, the scanning technology is always going to get better. There's stereoscopic cameras and things. And uh, eventually, you know, we, we will have them into our mobile devices. But uh, they're a little bit clunky today still. So scanning obviously can be a starting point for art, like you mentioned, uh, for, for creating non-engineering parts, like stuff that isn't boring. And we have an actual art gallery right to the right of us and I've seen some of that art uh, being shown on the uh, on the Euromold in Frankfurt uh, last November but it's even it's an even bigger art gallery right here and a lot of it is made with processes I don't know how, how, they're, how they're pulling them off um, probably some of it is, is polyjet um, others is SLA I suppose but uh, art and uh, you know artistic creation seems to be a huge thing that, that 3D printers are, are being used for right now. Even though it, it started, that, that 3D printing revolution thing, started on a completely different basis. So, Richard, are, are you doing artsy stuff? Um. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I don't class myself as an artist, but um, I really appreciate the work that people put in to using 3D printers and art. And, and it's one, one part of the aspect of 3D printing that's um, misunderstood as well, because some of these works of art you can see have had amazing amounts of post-processing as well. They're not just 3D printed and beautiful. There's enormous amounts of, of effort um, uh, that goes into producing these, and they're really, really expensive, some of them to actually make. So, yeah, the processes that are used for producing some of the art we've got around us today uh, are just inconceivable for the average user, but they do produce beautiful pieces of work. Um, a lot of people still criticize the fact that they're plastic and they're resin-based and they want them to feel more like bronze and all of the usual things, but that's art. You know, art is, is down to what you believe and how much energy has been put into it and what you get back from it so I think that's just a perception of the material limitations that people are forcing upon uh, you know the artists that are using this to create beautiful works and it shouldn't really be a, a stumbling block for you know further development of, of art in, in using 3d printing for art uh, I think that again back to the scanning getting getting something in there that you can actually start manipulating is the first step and and that will help a lot more people get going with 3d printing there's no real good organic 
tools for generating organic art and even when you've got them they're really difficult to print on 3D printers. Desktop 3D printers hate organic structures uh, producing loads of support structures and loads of things that are really difficult to do so that's a, that's a stepping stone uh, much easier with uh, some of the polyjet technologies and the object style, style printers that have self supports uh, and we'll see more and more of that but um, yeah, the, the art side of things. I wish I would do. I wish I had more time to do more of it. Um, and I think the closest thing I get with art is uh, using my scrap <laughs> to produce artistic works. Uh, but I, I would like to do more, more organic sculpture and that sort of thing. I have got a few things in my garden that I've designed and I've put in my garden, and they're, they're works of art in my own way. <laughs> so yeah, I do like that. <laughs> So I guess the, the, the only other thing I get asked a lot about is where, where 3D printing is going, especially for the desktop side of things, and how fast it will get there, and when, there's always the question of when, when will we have a 3D printer in every home, and I still really don't believe in that, I don't believe there's a real need for having a 3D printer in every home, and uh, it's still a constant sort of the expectation that it's all going to change in five years, and I think that's a bit a bit hard to believe. I, I would love to believe it, but I find it quite hard to, to see that in five years' time we're going to be a lot different to where we are now, because for 30 years we've been doing the same thing with FDM, and we've got a little bit faster and we've got more materials, but why is it all going to change in five years? You know, Carbon 3D is not going to change us dramatically, it's going to speed things up, but there's limitations with those processes, and um, so that's the bit I think that the industry still needs to uh, address, you know, that th this is still a prototyping tool. It's got some great uses, some fun uses, and, you know, the, the, all the different paste materials we're seeing and the exploration of that is going to give us more things to, to play with, to experiment with, but the fundamental layering process, technology, is still going to be the same for quite some time to come. And I think that's the reality, that we're not, we're not moving ever faster forward. Actually, I think the gap between desktop 3D printing and professional 3D printing is probably increasing at a rapid rate because we are seeing more full color 3D printer systems and more all sorts of uh, really high-end systems that are rapidly becoming the standard for printing figurines and printing beautiful works of art and actually that's the process that people will choose if they're basing a business around it or an artistic studio they're going to choose that. They might choose desktop printers for prototyping, experimenting, um, I always recommend you know artistic uh, any jewelry designers to just buy a maker bot or uh, no didn't didn't I say that yes. I, d I said maker bot yes. no. okay ultimaker that's what I meant to say oh my no that's terrible I just disastrous okay so I recommend people buy one of these to do prototyping at four times scale so they can see their works of art or they can see their their objects but actually they're going to use a really high resolution process um, to produce the actual finished finished articles oh, I swear yeah. That. Jeez. yeah I'm, I'm not gonna cut that out <laughs> yeah and I think it's um, it's good that the printer manufacturers are optimizing for that consumer market for, for not being super high-end. I mean, you're, you're saying you're not seeing a 3D printer in every home. I don't know. I, I don't want to, to totally exclude that possibility. Maybe. Maybe. We, we got 2D printers in every home. We got computers in every home. We, nobody expected that. But, I mean, you're right. We're not going to have a total revolution in five years. Look, Just look five years back. It's still the same machines. They're, they've gotten better, yes, they've gotten more reliable, but they're still doing the same thing. Um, they are already so useful for so many things, and I think if, if we just focus on those and, and get those really working well, I think then, yeah, we've got a bright future ahead of us. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, thanks, man. Thanks a lot. And thanks. Stay tuned for more. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.